In these times of uncertainty, it's all the more important that we keep collaborating, informing and inspiring each other, so that we can be smarter and better tomorrow. Welcome to the Pakhuis de Zwijger livecast. Good evening, welcome. My name is Nadine Ridder and I'm your moderator tonight. I would like to give you a warm welcome on behalf of myself and Pakhuis de Zwijger. And tonight I'm welcoming you to the second edition of the program um, Pakhuis de Zwijger developed in collaboration with Foam magazine around the Foam exhibition. So the uh, entire series uh, consists of three live casts and in total we speak to six artists. And we have two of the artists tonight uh, with us via Zoom uh, from Italy. And the first um, artist that I would like to present to you is uh, Simona Sapienza. Simona, how are you doing? Hello, I'm fine, thank you. Great to have you here. Thanks so much for, for making the time to uh, give us an insight into um, all the work that, you, uh, that you've been doing. Um, and Camillo uh, Pascarelli is also with us from Italy. Welcome, how are you? Hi, I'm fine. How are you doing? I'm really, really well. Thank you very much. And uh, for you, goes the same, of course. Um, so tonight, uh, we specifically look um, into a new wave of documentary uh, photography. Uh, and I'm not doing it in the studio by myself, and gladly. So I have uh, with me on the left, uh, Isabel uh, van Hemert. Uh, you are the picture editor at The Correspondent. Welcome. Thank nice you. to have you here. How are you doing? Thank you. Good, good, good. Yeah. Yeah. Can you uh, briefly explain uh, what your job entails? Sure. Um, I'm a picture editor together with two other picture editors at the Dutch independent journalism platform, The Correspondent. Um, so we, we only publish online um, and we uh, publish articles that are in addition to the traditional uh, news media. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's very well known in the Netherlands. I think quite, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's great to have you here also to get a broader uh, perspective on uh, the work of our two artists tonight and um, and the themes that we're discussing. Uh, I also have on my right, uh, Amelie Schule. Welcome to have you here again. You were with us, uh, you were with us the first edition as well. How are you? I'm good, thanks. It's lovely to be back with you. Yes. <laughs> Um, I think uh, we should start with you. Um, for the people who haven't seen the first edition and not, are not completely familiar, can you explain a little bit more about a foam talent and uh, specifically about the series that you developed with uh, Pakhuis de Zwijger around this? Yes, so foam talent is a reoccurring uh, part of the talent trajectory within foam. So every year there will be a talent call launch and then uh, we have applications from all over the world. For this year we had over 1,600 people applying from over 69 countries. So there's really a broad interest in it. Wow. And um, yeah, well, from this, there will be a selection made within the, with the editorial and curatorial team within Foam. And then for this year, the exhibition uh, was curated by Miriam Koiman. And together with her, we uh, developed also a public programming running alongside uh, the exhibition, which is at Foam, but unfortunately Foam is closed, but we have also a digital uh, exhibition of all the artworks and well we wanted to use the opportunity to work with Backhouse to highlight six artists yeah uh, so always a pair of artists um, which are paired by a specific theme that connects them mm -hmm. and um, it was really interesting because through this comparing we can really talk about some discourses and also maybe connections to social uh, movements that are happening yeah. and uh, today talking to Camilo and Simona is really interesting because the, art, the two artists have different aesthetics but from their approach they really fit well together because both of them are documenting a place or a specific area or a specific discourse uh, in that area by yeah, developing its a, a language or a visual language uh, that is not, not what you would expect from a documentary project, mm -hmm. but it's really a different approach that kind of also tries to reshape how an image that informs you could look. Mm -hmm. And what is interesting throughout the series that it's really the style that is chosen also shows a presence of the artist or the maker. Yeah. So that really gives you a different way of also looking at the work because 
in these two projects, the artists are very much present through the choices that they make and how the pictures are created. Mm -hmm. So I think that's super interesting and having also Isabel here who comes from a journalistic background, it can be interesting to see how she actually reflects on this approach to a topic. Yeah. Great. So that's why uh, you paired them together, not because they're both from Italy. No, but no. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for, for sharing this with us. Um, Simona. Yeah. Um, we will uh, get into conversation with you. Um, we're talking about your work, um, Charlie Serves on Lotus Flowers, today specifically. Um, can you tell us a little bit more um, about the project, how and why uh, you started this? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I started this project in 2015, during my uh, third year at the university in Newport, where I was studying documentary photography. Mm -hmm. And it was just the, the starting point. I was looking to, to make a, a new project abroad after three years in the, in the UK. And I can't even remember why I chose Vietnam as the starting point. I just started to read some news and articles about the economy mm -hmm. in, that, in that country. And I started to become curious about how the Vietnam uh, would like today, uh, look like today. And, uh, um, because I was thinking, let's say, how I didn't know so much Vietnam War before to start the course in documentary photography. I didn't study the, the Vietnam War the, at the high school mm -hmm. because we were uh, running out of time from the national program, let's say. Mm -hmm. And I, I was lucky because thanks to documentary photography and the tons of photo books about the war, I started to discover something I was, I was missing. So I, I started to to focus on that topic and then the, the economy and the googling about the, uh, the country. They were, let's say, basic to get in love, fall in love with the, with the country. So after the first travel, I was deeper and deeper into the project. And, uh, and that's how it started to happen. And then after the uni, I did continue the project again for, more, for a few more years. Yeah, so how long did it take you, the entire project? Uh, it was for uh, three years and a half, okay, wow. from 2015 and 2018. Yeah, so it's a really long project for you. You worked on it quite a, for quite some time. Uh, yes, kind of. I mean, it was long, but not too much. Yeah, okay. Well, um, let's have a look at, um, at your work, and maybe you can explain a little bit about uh, what we see in the pictures. Uh, okay, let's say somehow uh, the, the first step into the project was the, the massive research about the, the facts and the economy in, in Vietnam, how the capitalism was uh, uh, taking over in the, the country, despite the, the communism. Uh, I started the project in the, uh, four, um, in the fourth anniversary, after, I mean, 20, 40 years after the end of the, of the American war. And so the mass media were giving a lot of attention to the, to the topic and also to the comparison how the country has changed or the, the communism is changing as well. And, uh, um, and then I start to have, a, at the first point, uh, at the starting point, a kind of more uh, photojournalistic approach, more descriptive approach. But then travel by travel, year by year, I was taking, let's say, uh, a step far about the, the topic. So the idea at the end was a kind of uh, translating the, the facts and the stats into my visual uh, interpretation of the, of the country, mm -hmm. uh, looking for uh, uh, some scenes or, or facts or, uh, or images that were reminding me the, the starting, uh, uh, the, the research at the, the starting point. So let's say the metaphorical aspects, the metaphorical approach was, uh, was basic uh, during the the flow of the work. Yeah, so uh, we see now the, the, the red backdrop. We see that uh, a lot coming back in your work. Can you, can you explain a little bit how, um, why you chose this specific um, color for the backdrop? Yeah, actually those, uh, those pictures were made uh, during my really first travel. It was just a kind of, uh, uh, let's say, test for uh, um, a sort of installation. I was doing a kind of uh, uh, stage portraits on the, on the sidewalk of uh, Ho Chi Minh City, uh, the former Saigon in the south of Vietnam. 
So there was a kind of uh, pop-up studio just on the street of the economical district of, uh, um, of the city. And uh, uh, because the idea at the beginning was to make a kind of uh, installation collage with, uh, with the colors of the, of the flag to make a new uh, capitalistic flag of the, of the country. But then five years after that picture, they were like uh, put in the, in the box in, the, in some uh, hard drive. Uh, when we start to work on the, on the photo book, we, uh, we take them out again to, to use them. And then uh, I start to use those pictures mixed with the other ones. So those, those pictures were kind of uh, uh, of limbo between uh, uh, fiction and reality because mm -hmm. there was a pop-up studio, there was the fake background, but then they were made in their really daily life scenes. Yeah, so why did you, um, you say you, you speak a lot and we see a lot of uh, metaphors, and why do you specifically choose this method over, let's say, um, one-dimensional pictures? You mean for the, uh, for the vertical stuff? No, actually, for everything. Like, why why do you specifically um, uh, work with the with the method of of using a lot of uh, metaphors and symbols instead of the the reality? Okay, okay. Um, well, uh, during my my studies, and uh, I I changed my idea about how documentary photography can uh, um, can shape different uh, different visions. So it's not just the the, the typical descriptive approach. To, uh, to tell about the reality, so with a kind of more uh, subjective and personal interpretation of the, of the facts. And, uh, and somehow, uh, for me, the, the, the important step was to, to research about the, 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 the topic in this case, of the, the country. And then uh, I felt it was uh, um, more appropriate to also to leave the audience free who have also different opinions mm -hmm. and to see further, maybe more than I, I can see myself. Yeah, so it's up for our interpretation, you say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, you call it a, a sequence of metaphorical responses to notions of power, economy, energy, exoticism, and politics. That's a mouthful. Um, what do you actually mean by that exactly? It's a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's say the, um, the basic fact was the, the fact that the, uh, the communism, as we, we, we know today, is changing a lot. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the country is one of the, um, one of, with the economy in the world is most fast growing. So it's, uh, um, it's growing a lot. Is getting better and better as one of the, um, uh, let's say, with the highest rise in the in the uh, in the world in time of uh, uh, development. Uh, but even though uh, the uh, the power is still the is still one of the five uh, um, communist dictatorship left in mm -hmm. the in the world is still only one uh, one party. So that the power was one of the uh, key word. For the for the project, and and somehow the idea was uh, also to speak about Vietnam at the starting point, but also to reflect on other countries, maybe countries with a similar history where the history repeats itself, mm -hmm. where the the local people are so um, so proud to have freed the, the country from the from the Western people, mm -hmm. but then at the end there is no there is no freedom at all. It's another dictatorship. So that the history is uh, repeating again, and somehow the capitalism, the free market economy, is a kind of long-term win of the USA on the on the economical side. So there was a lot of uh, topics that were, let's say, mixing each other and uh, intertwining themselves. Yeah. All right. Um, so. Can you, um, I just want to have a look at a specific uh, piece of your art. Can you uh, explain to us what do we see in this photo? Can you see it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so this picture, for instance, was, uh, uh, let's say, it, it's one of the pictures where there are different, let's say, uh, topics uh, combining all together. Uh, let's say on the uh, descriptive uh, uh, point of view, it's a, 
Uh, it's a guy who is working at the Kuchi Town Museum in the outs um, outside of Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, actually, wore like a, a Viet Cong soldier, but it's actually then a, it's a kind of actor. is a is a touristic guide, and and I, I was so interested in this kind of uh, let's say uh, fiction into the reality with this kind of uh, fake nature background. But also is is look is a kind of uh, uh, lost into the future, mm -hmm. and somehow is this one of the few pictures where you can actually see the the faces of the of the people. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's one of those portraits where I can more reflect my point of view. I let's say the, the Vietnam is one of the most optimistic country in the world because they are the beginning of the the rise of the of the economy. So let's say about the 90% of the parents are optimistic that children will have a better future mm -hmm. in the same country. If you look at the stats about the Western country, Italy, for instance, is about 14% who are optimistic because it's like Italy 30 years ago when yeah. we were already like in, another, uh, in another phase uh, stage. And so it's a kind of my, let's say, um, pessimism about the future, about the, the capitalism doesn't bring, uh, let's say, luck to everyone, but maybe it brings more uh, um, inequality. The richer will be richer and the poor will be poorer. Mm -hmm. So it's maybe it's my, one of the pictures where I can more see myself, my point of view, yeah. as, a, as a foreign. Yeah, nice. And um, this, this photo that we see right now? Uh, this is one of those pictures that were just made in, uh, during my uh, daily uh, walk into the street because one of the most difficult things about this project it was really broad. So every day I was just uh, walking into the street of, uh, uh, of different cities in, the, in Vietnam and looking for, for metaphors, mm -hmm. looking for uh, some, uh, some pictures, some, some scenes that were reminding me the, the key facts or the, uh, the, um, the main important topics of the project. So it's just a daily scene where there is this seller of birds into the, the street, on the street of the, uh, this city in the central, central Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, so for some pictures, the caption is not really useful <laughs> because somehow you are, uh, um, uh, let's say you are, taking the freedom to the audience to reinterpret the, the reality. Yeah. Even though for other pictures, the caption would be maybe more important because they refer to some historical places or, or facts and, and so on. So mm -hmm. it's just one of those kind of daily, daily scenes. Yeah, nice. Okay, can we, can we have a look at uh, another photo? Yes. Um, it's just a, a reproduction of, uh, uh, of the city in, uh, in central Vietnam. Mm -hmm. It was to be uh, a church they, uh, they want to, to build in the, uh, in, the, in the kind of development project of the, um, of the city. And this kind of uh, fake city is again into that mood of fiction, into the, uh, the reality. Yeah. And the flower, which is kind of... Uh, one of the, uh, let's say, metaphor in this, uh, I mean, the metaphor in the, in the title of the project and then also this kind of uh, shape of the, um, of the building mm -hmm. is again one of the, um, let's say, one of the metaphors about the project itself. Yeah. It's kind of muddy flowers, it's kind of beautiful flowers rising from the, from the muddy water. So, which is kind of typical in the, uh, uh, in those countries. Yeah. So kind of, Kind of similar to the history of Vietnam. So after the the, the bad time uh, during the war, now they are rising again in that beautiful shape. All right. Can we have one one more photo to look at? Yeah, yeah. So uh, do you want to know? <laughs> yeah, let the, yeah let us know what are we looking at. Um, there's actually just some. Uh, uh, some fake models to promote uh, uh, Vietnamese airlines. They were just put in the corner of, uh, of a shop, all wrapped with this plastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
And this, this kind of picture in between to many others isn't that kind of uh, idea of, of power. This kind of women who are actually wrapped and they are fake again. So this kind of fake pictures, fake reality, who are still in the same in the same mood. Yeah. But then is also again one of those pictures where the caption is actually giving less than the picture itself. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, um, a question. You uh, concluded this project with a book um, that tied actually multiple chapters uh, of your work in uh, Vietnam and other and other places together. What do you? What was your? Uh, what was the story you would like to uh, convey with your book specifically? So at the beginning there was no uh, no reason to make a book. So uh, I, I was running a photo book festival at that time was 2015, so ages ago, and I was sick of photo books, <laughs> photo books. But then at some point I, I realized, oh, this kind of approach actually needed a kind of a really good number of pictures. It's not a kind of style that you can use for 10, 15 pictures like a portfolio or five pictures like in a, in a magazine, because they're kind of, again, metaphorical, not really descriptive pictures. So, if I want to, to, to tell a broad story, with this kind of out of context pictures, uh, I needed a kind of uh, a really broad number of, uh, of pictures of photographs. So the book was actually the object that was able to me, making able to me to, uh, to have this kind of uh, narration using this, uh, this style. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Um, thanks for, for, for providing so much uh, information about the work and thank you for your beautiful work, of course, thank as you. well. Um, we, we will go over to, uh, to Camillo and have a look at uh, his work as well. Uh, we will talk to you later, of course. Um, Anna, first, actually, I would like to ask you, uh, Camillo, what do you think about the work that, um, that we've just seen of Simone? Um. I mean, I think that uh, the, one of the great value that of this work is like his, uh, is, I, I found it like it's a super engaging work and uh, it really resonates to my practice, uh, what Simone has just said. And like, I think that it's, it's one of the first time that we do something, we talk together, me and Simone, about our work. So for, for example, I didn't know that he had this, uh, started this project with a very photojournalistic approach which is something that really resonates to my experience uh, um, as well. And also, like, it really, um, I want to underline this, and I really agree about trying to um, create a work that push the audience to be in an active and engaging relationship with the images and with the book. So as a sequence of images, so you just like, uh, I'm giving you some information, I'm giving you a, frame, a framework of, of, of meaning, but then you as audience, you as a, as a viewer, you have to really create your own interpretation and, uh, you know, go through the, the images through your, uh, through, through your eyes, through your knowledge and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, let's let's have a look at uh, your work um, okay. because the work that we will be looking at is um, called Monsoons Never Cross the Mountains. And um, same for you. Can you explain a little bit how you started this project and what made you uh, what made you do this? Um, I was in so the, the project is about Kashmir Valley, so this contested land between India and Pakistan since 1947. And uh, I ended up during a trip uh, in India in 2010 in Kashmir, and uh, I didn't know very much about the issue, but I, I completely uh, I, mean, I got entangled with this place, with this uh, wonderful valley. So I went back in 2015 for my uh, research, for my master's degree in anthropology at that time. So I spent there six months. And after that, I was studying the, the, the political situation, so the separatist movement uh, in Kashmir. So because like the population is actually demanding he, their rights against the uh, Indian administration. And uh, soon after my degree, I realized that probably writing, because usually anthropologists 
right? Mm-hmm. Um, it was not like my, my cup of tea was like not the right tool to express myself. So I, 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 I started to, to work more on my photography that I already started in 2015, with, but with no, with no consciousness. Um, I went back in Kashmir after that every year until 2000, late 2018. And, um, and I started to work with a very photojournalistic approach as Simone, because I was also studying uh, a master in photojournalism in Rome at that time. And, uh, and soon after, I think like one year, I really started to feel uh, not, not, not have, like, inadequate with my images. I was not sa- satisfied with the imaginary that I was creating about a conflict zone. So, you know, like, more doubt about how do you portray suffering, how do you portray violence, because Kashmir is one of the most militarized zones in the world. And, uh, like, as you can imagine, half of the army uh, is deployed in the valley. And, as you can imagine, human rights violations are on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. So I, I realized that like, I needed to start to, to take pictures in a very, very free way, like without any uh, meaning, without any direction. Um, so I tried to experiment for a little bit, and then I realized that I needed a specific, a specific point of view for this work. And that's when it came out that children's point of view could be the right key to create an emotional landscape to uh, depict this zone uh, through a more uh, oniric uh, and emotional uh, approach. And uh, so the entire work is following this, uh, this path, uh, creating a claustrophobic uh, atmosphere and also trying to uh, decontextualize uh, the place. So you, you, you actually never see Kashmir how does it look like until mm-hmm. the very end of the of, of, of the work or, or the book and the last page of the book, um, which is so, something sorry, that is... Uh, sorry, yeah. Camilla, just to, to um, make that more clear, the, the, the children's point of view, how does that uh, come across in, into your, in your work? How can we, how, can we see, uh, how can we see that coming to life? Because yeah, uh, Kash, uh, children, point, children doesn't perceive reality as we, as we perceive, so uh, they... Meaning, the meaning of an object, the meaning of something is a, is a cultural uh, structure. We, we give it in our social world, we give it because we got socialized in our society. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for a children, uh, something that is like floating in there can be whatever it can be. So it's just like free of interpretation, there is no structure. And that could, that could allow me to um, create these very confusing and disturbing uh, images and also this create disturbing and also near um, visual narrative. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, we're just going to have a look at some of your photos as well. If you uh, can tell us what we see in the, in the photos. Uh, this is a, a dead wolf in the, <laughs> one of the uh, closest area of Kashmir to close to the Pakistan border and uh, so yeah I mean of course you're dealing so the, the big question was like how you uh, create this narrative through the children point of view but of course you have to create this atmosphere that can be happy that needs to deliver this disturbed and uh, um, restless and suffered uh, atmosphere so this kind of images could, you know, uh, try to create this uh, atmosphere. Yeah. <clears throat> and this one? Uh, this is like, I mean, this is, uh, again, a children. So you, you have the point of view of the children, but of course you see children in the, in the book. And uh, this was um, a family actually living in an abandoned uh, cinema hall. So during the 90s, there was a huge uh, civil war between uh, Kashmir, army rebellions, and the army. So it was like a decade of huge uh, violence. And all the cinemas got occupied by the Indian army. And they did interrogation centers, torture centers. And this was one of, the, of, the, of, the, of these places that got abandoned then in the, uh, I think, early 2000s. And so now some, some, some families were illegally uh, living inside there. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. that's really impressive. So how, yeah, okay. Um, this, this image? 
Uh, actually, mo most of the image doesn't have really uh, a specific uh, meaning. I mean, uh, as Simona was saying, like some of the majority of my image, I would say, doesn't really have any caption. Yeah. Really, it's like the, the narrative of, of one, first because like I really believe that uh, my work, but like a lot of work really can be um, approached through a single image. You really need to go through, you know, the narrative, the sequence to get the, uh, the, 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 the right, the right. The story. The right yeah. The full story. Yeah. 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 I understand. Um, so um, you also, you already mentioned it, that you're also uh, an, an anthropologist. Can you yeah. elaborate a little bit more on how this uh, influences your work? Yeah. Uh, I mean, specifically for this work, uh, I've been studying a lot for, uh, about the Kashmir issue because it's something that is going on since uh, 1947. So there are different aspects that you need to, that I got studying. So like religion, politics, the role of memory and the role, the political role of memory because it's a, a struggle going on since 1947, especially in the last 30 years got very uh, violent. And the role of the martyrs is a crucial point in this in this work. And but aside all the you know the information that I that I elaborated during my, my, my study, one of the main things is that like anthropologists, you, know, you will say that you have like a box tool of anthropologists, and uh, that was like really uh, with me through all my projects, but actually it's really with my photography today, and uh, like the consciousness and the self reflexivity that anthropologists taught me is, I think, is a crucial, uh, is a crucial aspect of my practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's beautiful how, how these two, uh, uh, how this all comes together to see it. Um, so it was a very long-term project. You said, how many years did you work on it in total? Uh, 2015 since 2019, yeah. last 19, yeah. So um, it was executed along other projects, right? You were working on other projects at the same time. Um, how did these um, parallel process impact your work? And um, how does the series compare to a short-term project? Can you, can you explain a little bit more on, on, on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, this, uh, yeah, I was doing like, uh, at the same time, also short-term project even in Kashmir actually, and even like a, a, a different project on Kashmir was like much more about human rights violation was like, I would say that was much, it was more editorial, mm -hmm. but uh, it was like really much more about human rights violation in, in, in Kashmir. And uh, I think there are just two parallel uh, rails of my, of my train that just keep going on. Uh, even now I'm working on short term documentary project and long term project yeah so they're documentary or not but yeah i also you do you do editorial yeah i really like to 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 keep these two trails that can got connect get connected or not yeah okay um i, I would um can we go back one visual please because I, I would really like to hear your story about these specific visuals yeah so um in the project there are the so-called uh, uh, second-hand photography, or like, you know, the photo through as von Kubert uh, speak about it. So they are um, holy cards, actually, mm -hmm. who, which represent Sufi saints. So Kashmir region is a Muslim majority region, and majority of the people follow the Sufi uh, sect of Islam. Mm -hmm. And one of the main practices of Sufism is worship saints uh, into shrines. So when you go to shrines, and it's a very like uh, local and very um, common thing in Kashmir, you will find outside street vendors selling these small holy cards. And so I collected them through, uh, through my, my trips. And as Simona was speaking about the, the image with the, with the red, red background, I never used it. I never thought to use it. I just found it like super visually, super interesting. Then only when I was working at the book, we realized that they were super interesting and we also realized that there was a very um, meaning for them in the book because I, I believe, but I mean, sociologists and anthropologists also believe in this theory that mm -hmm. there is a kind of, you know, uh, inner importance, inner role uh, into Kashmir society of death and like worshiping death. 
So in a way, there is a continuum between this tradition, religious tradition of worshiping that uh, of saints and worshiping of all the martyrs uh, that, who died for the struggle for freedom uh, by the Indian army hand. Yeah. And also in a way, like they really remind me uh, the you know a children that is like you know uh, writing with a pen on a very like yeah on, 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 on a card. Some of them are really painted. Mm -hmm. That is beautiful. It's, it's very special to see. Thank you. Um, I would really like to know, Isabel, what what do you think uh, of the work of? Um, well, I Camilla. guess, yeah, well, both Camilo's work and Simona's work, they remind me very much of my own work. Um, uh, before uh, I went here, I had a quick look at the images that are to be found um, in uh, Getty, in the image library of Getty, uh, when, you, when you look up uh, Kashmir, Kashmir Valley. And what you see then are these uh, street views, almost always taken from a, a low point of view, wide angle images. Most of, mo in most cases you see barbed wire uh, and there are two, one or two soldiers uh, standing against a wall or in the middle of the street. Um, in some cases they interact with one or two civilians, but other than that, the whole street is empty. And of this image, there are countless variations. Mm -hmm. It's uh, like, Whereas, in fact, actually, when you when you made this image once, uh, I think that would be enough to tell this story, and all the rest is actually redundant. So um, there's a there's a real need, I think, for for other visual strategies to talk about this uh, uh, this region. Um, and I think it's very interesting that uh, you, uh, Camilo, take this uh, this perspective of the child um, to talk about this region, because what happens with me, at least, when I look at these images. Um, I, I bring my own memories of my own childhood, mm -hmm. that innocence, the playfulness. I bring that to uh, my experience of uh, viewing the images, which I think um, gives a completely different, um, leaves a completely different impression of what is happening there uh, than when I look uh, at this street view image where there are two soldiers uh, quite anonymously um, posing uh, in the middle of the street. Um, and I think uh, what, I'm, what I also really like about your work, Camilo, is that you really uh, started from this uh, photojournalistic background. So that makes it, for me, um, quite logical to look at this approach right now because you, you respond to what you have previously been doing. Um, because, of course, as an image editor, we're always also thinking about who has the right to speak about what. Uh, and, of course, you're from Italy uh, and... Um, uh, yeah, my first question would be is why are you stel telling this story? Uh, but knowing that you have this photojournalistic background, that makes uh, makes much sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, let's let's dive into a little bit deeper into uh, into your work because you have a very specific approach at the correspondent. Um, so, how do you screen pictures? Um, can you can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, well, I think me and my colleague image editors, we consider ourselves uh, first and foremost to be matchmakers. So it's not so much, I think we avoid uh, selecting images from Getty, for example, or other uh, stock image libraries uh, as much as we can. Um, we prefer working with uh, um, photographers and visual artists um, um, uh, that have a very specific take on uh, on the subject matter of a story that we're publishing. So, actually, um, uh, our way of working is uh, is so that uh, one of our writers writes a story. Mm -hmm. uh, that's actually the starting point for everything that we publish, and then uh, that gets to us, the image editors, and then we start uh, thinking about what kind of imagery uh, would fit alongside that. In a, and and what is really important for us is that we. Um, we don't want to publish images that are decorative. We don't want to publish images that are merely illustrations of what has already been said in text. So we want uh, images that really add something mm -hmm. to the words of the writers. Um, and I think that's uh, that the best chances of succeeding in that regard is by looking for uh, visual artists or photographers that are, are already um, familiar with the subject matter that is being discussed by the writer. Um, and um, yeah, so so actually at the matchmaking, how we how we do that mm -hmm. to stick to that word, uh, there are two uh, two possibilities. <laughs> actually, we can 
we can publish um, existing work. This is something that we that we often do. For example, when we would have a story about the Kashmir Valley uh, or about um, uh, well, let's stick to the Kashmir Valley. If we would have a story about that, I would, uh, for example, very well, uh, I could very well end up with your work and uh, and publish that alongside this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but we also commission artists uh, who uh, have uh, the same thematic focus uh, in their body of work uh, as the subject matter of that specific story and we commission them to create something new. Um, and what I really love about this way of working is that these uh, visual artists and photographers in most cases are very aware of the stereotypes, the cliches uh, that come with uh, the subject matter that they're depicting. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, of course, it's uh, it's best to avoid those. Um, and also, to it, it makes it easier for them uh, to get to more surprising visuals uh, instead of uh, the, the images like the one that I described that we already see everywhere. You know, it's yeah. Kind of, uh, yeah. So how does the how does the audience react on this way of working? Because it's very it's very specific, right? It's very different than what we normally see. Yeah. Um, well, actually, I'm always very surprised. Uh, how little response there is from the from the readers of the articles themselves, even when we uh, when we publish images that I would say are really provoking. Uh, we have this comment section below the articles, uh, but but responses about the images are um, are rarely there. This is also why I think it's very important about to talk about our, our process of image editing to um, to make clear that these choices are very deliberate uh, and that it's not a, a quick selection to just fill a space that is meant for an image, but it's really... Um, is it explained? Yeah. Do you explain the image also? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So below the article, we always have a well, not always. If we have existing work that we publish uh, alongside an article, uh, we always have an introduction of the of the artist and the work. Um, and in some cases, uh, we elaborate in a different article a bit more on the work. Or um, I sometimes write a small newsletter uh, that I uh, in which I. Um, explain uh, my process of thought that uh, preceded the choice uh, for a certain series. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we do we do try to do that as much as possible. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, back to the work. Uh, mm -hmm. Both Camilla and S Simone, they um, handle different approaches of documentary photo photography. Um, is this something that you also see with other photographers? Yeah, I think it's, it's happening a lot, actually. Um, of course, what what I really what really fascinate, fascinates me about the work of uh, Simone is that um, I read a little bit about your your process and um, the fact that you that you actually started with um, the fact that you actually don't know anything about Vietnam other than the images or the secondhand experiences that you. Uh, uh, that you had through film, for example, or through tourist images, or through uh, uh, photojournalism by Don McCullin. Um, uh, wait, I forgot your question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> I was I was saying if you see similar uh, ways of working and new methods. With ah, like other that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So of course. Um, I think um, the question of what photojournalism is has has for uh, a couple of years already, or even longer, been uh, uh, been heavily de heavily debated. Yeah. Um, and of course, you see that in um, in the work of a photojournalist. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's something that you recognize as well. I think, Emily. Yeah, of course. And I think why I thought it was interesting, of course, also for, for example, the title of the talk, we're not actually referring to photojournalism, but to documentary photography. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I thought why it was, it was interesting to look at actually this kind of subcategory within documentary photography. So, of course, this has also been going on for a while, but we have shifted from this discussion around photojournalism to actually looking within documentary photography, which is a different realm maybe mm -hmm. about how those approaches within that also are different and I thought like what you said about how in you as a writer or you as a picked image editor you are thinking about who do what work do I pick to show alongside this article and in the same way the artists or the photographers are thinking of what type of image do I choose for this specific topic mm -hmm. so I find it interesting how it's like um, as it is a move within journalism, shown as example with the correspondent, but also within the work on the visual level, uh, a yeah a shift in how to uh, express a certain topic or standpoint. And yeah. It's actually interesting that Camilo also said that 
yeah, he was, um, yeah, you know, well, both I think said that that going for images was easier than going for words. And you were saying this about how, yeah, there can be another way of talking about a story. And by doing this in the articles, we also kind of inspire to that, to the audience, mm -hmm. maybe in a passive manner, but it could also be interesting to see how that can change a way of perceiving a place, a story, a topic, a discourse. Yeah. I think it's really interesting. So is it important that there's more perspectives at the same time happening for so the viewer gets more uh, space to, in, to make their own in interpretations based on different perspectives than just the either visual one or, or the one in the story? Yeah, I yeah. would say that's of course something that is happening. Uh, like it's about when we talk about fake news, for example, mm -hmm. when you see an image, you can't trust the image. So by being by learning that an image has always been shaped by someone, like an image selection has always been shaped by someone, you also develop a completely difficult, different approach to read an image, like you would, might actually read a text with a critical eye. But uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. is there is there um, what's happening between the, the the writer and and the visual artist? Is there a conversation as well around the work? Well, it depends. It really depends on the, the artist. So we have certain uh, writers, or really depends on the writer. I mean, we have certain writers that are very interested in images and how they can complement their story. Uh, we have uh, writers that are a little bit less interested in it. But it also, of course, really depends on the topic because, um, and I, this I think is also one of the challenges of uh, imagery in uh, in journalism today, uh, is that many of the, the, the issues that are that are shaping our lives nowadays, they're quite invisible. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think people that are not, not working with images on a daily basis, they are perhaps um, less... Um, Sorry, can you, can you explain a little bit more? Like why are they not, what, what do you mean by this exactly? Well, in the sense, for example, if you think, for example, about information wars, data wars, it's not visible, uh, trading systems are not visible. Um, but also, for example, if you think about the coronavirus, it's a very, uh, a very literal uh, example. But when the, when, uh, the pandemic uh, hit, um, well, Western Europe, uh, you saw the, the microscopic illustration of the corona yeah. uh, cell everywhere, you know? So this is also um, an example of... Uh, so how did you approach this, for example? Well, we I think we uh, always try to uh, distill the, the main insight from the story of mm -hmm. a writer uh, and take that as our uh, point of departure for finding images. So... Uh, it's not so much about the subject matter. Uh, you of don't the literally story. look for a translation. No, no exactly. Yeah. And I think that that allows us to be much more free in the images that we choose. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's that's very promising for the future. Yeah, I have right. high hopes for uh, <laughs> for images and journalism in that sense. Yes. So yeah, it's it's actually interesting because we uh, we're facing some some very. Uh, um, interesting interconnected crisis at the moment so yeah you already said it we have covid we have climate change we have uh, all related environmental and social issues um so um what do you think um simona do you um can you share a little bit uh, about how you think this will influence um documentary photography uh, in your view you mean the the lockdown the, the pandemic well, I mean, everything that we're facing right now and how it all is, all is uh, a lot of people are, um, or a lot of people, we are facing a lot of interconnected um, crises at the moment and uh, people have to deal with a lot of different things at the same time. Do you feel that this is something, um, this transformation of looking at maybe the world a little bit different than a year ago? Um, can you, do you have an idea how that could shape um, photography, uh, documentary photography? Well, I do think that the, the lockdown time and the, the pandemic, I mean, this kind of being forced to stay at home, it might be interesting to uh, maybe just to think more about our practice because we can, we can study more, we can research more and uh, go into more the, the theory. <laughs> But then, as well, we saw so many pictures about this kind of... Uh, we were speaking about uh, stereotypes first. Mm -hmm. So this kind of picture that look all the same about the, about the COVID. So it's always interesting how the, the photographer, the visual artist, can also give something more. Because as uh, she was saying first, uh, we have the text already in the magazines and the newspaper, how the, the photographer can add something 
and not just uh, copy and paste from the text to the pictures. So it's also interesting how the, the photographer can add something about the, this kind of climate issues and the or pandemic issues and this kind of crisis. Mm-hmm. And then, I mean, also to have a kind of metaphorical approach or more, let's say, artistic approach, it does not mean that that's not political. It can be political also with a different kind of uh, visual, uh, visual aesthetic. And maybe that's even more interesting because you are engaging more with the, with the audience, engaging more with the sponsors, engaging more with the, with the other people who are not really into, into photography. They, to see something more, uh, which is different from the pictures from the big agency or stock photography. So that may be something that me more, uh, let's say, the starting point to go deeper than into the, the issue. So the photographer is not the journalist or the or, my, or the um, the social analyzer and so on. We're giving you all the information about some crisis. Might might be the one who can catch the people to get into the, the topic. And images today is one of the most uh, accessible and uh, uh, and shared medium. Think about smartphones and Instagram and uh, all the advertising around the street. Mm-hmm. So we have a, a, this kind of medium which is really powerful on this uh, on this sense. Yeah, um, um, Camilla, what do you do you do you share um, Simone's view on this? Uh, yeah, I mean, some big issues are coming uh, coming out through Simone and through Amelia and Isabel, like uh, how do we picture a crisis? How do we deal with our our gaze? How we, how do we deal, for example, with our privileged gaze mm-hmm. and you know, the violence or the inappropriate gaze that we can have? Uh, how is the relation with with the viewer and um, I would just like add one thing that uh, Isabel said before, uh, which we connect to Simone actually, you know, working on stereotypes. And I mean, documentary photography, as we can consider it, even if I'm not really sure what are the boundaries of, of it, of this box, mm-hmm. um, you really need to be careful and conscious of the stereotype that you are, that you are engaging, because the medium is a history, we are a super. Uh, we have a super mediated relationship with reality, so you can't avoid wondering and doubting the imaginary that you are working. And I, 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 exactly what what Isabel said, like when you think about conflict zones, for example, Kashmir, you really see that kind of Getty images image. Mm-hmm. Shoot. And for example, I completely avoided to show soldiers in in, in the work. You, you never see the. The, the, the soldiers in, in, my, in my work because you don't need it. Yes. And uh, regarding COVID, really, I, I'm, I'm really like we are facing different crises. Documentary photography in this moment has a, got a huge importance, with, especially during the first lockdown. I mean, me and Simone, we were in Italy, so we were like the first, one of the first countries that really got the, the, the big crisis. And like, I wonder how the, the, the images got a huge importance in that moment because they really started or they really became again the mediated reality uh, of us because we couldn't get out. The only thing that we could see from outside was images. So, I mean, in a way, I think like consciousness can help us on uh, keep on working on documentary photography or like trying to portray reality through uh, uh, consciousness, uh, consciousness, yeah. Yeah. Great. Do you do you would, you would you like to elaborate on this? Well, in the sense that uh, what I really like about COVID, in a, in a f- sense of photography, is mm-hmm. that um, I think everybody became aware of the shortcomings of the of the image in experiencing reality. Um, I, I remember trying to explain this to people uh, while I was studying photography. Why I was I was very interested then in uh, how you could translate, for example, um, very physical experiences to the image. Um, uh, and people were always wondering, like, why do you why do you want to why why do you want to know that? For example, I know that a, that a table is heavy. Why do you want me to uh, understand that through an image? Uh, and I never really had a good answer to that, I think. But now it's because it's so, I don't know, it's such a such a primitive, I think, experience. But um, but I think through COVID, everybody 
yeah, understand now. People, uh, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they're more aware of, of what you were actually trying to do before already. So yeah. it really opens up, so it gives the opportunity for uh, this method to further um, develop as well. I think that's that's something that you, uh, you recognize. Yeah, and I think what I said at the beginning, I think this point of understanding that you have a position to things. So if you pick an image, if you write an article, or if you're a photographer, and actually being uh, super aware that you're choosing a specific point of view, a specific mm -hmm. aesthetic, and it can also be empowering to do so, as long as it is clearly labeled. And I think that's an interesting shift that actually is even asked for, like to have this type of view. And I think in both of the works, you can see it by like choosing uh, with Simone, how the metaphor or the different types of images and how they're interconnected, they are clearly not a one-to-one -one translation of reality. Mm -hmm. and I think it's super interesting once you disconnect the image from reality, all the emotions or additional things they can transport and I think that's super interesting for photography as a medium but also for documentary photography specifically because an experience of an image of a place is always subjective yeah. if I look at the image I will see something else than you will see so I like also that that becomes an awareness reality is not the same for anyone is always already subjective yeah I think that's super interesting and also when it comes to the reality of COVID on so many levels uh, we are learning this in the t this time yeah so so you I also heard you saying before uh, the personal is very present but it's not about it's not about the person it's about it always serves the project um yeah, I think that's that's really that, that's kind of uh, uh, sums it sums it up. Um, so, uh, what we would like to know oh, um, from both of you, of course, uh, what are you working on at the moment? Briefly, um, Simona, you first. Um, actually, didn't start any new big project so far. So, I'm uh, after the uni. It's a it's a definitely a new. Uh, a new path. So I'm working more uh, with the uh, with Spazolabo and Minimum, who are both uh, two um, uh, cultural centers about photography based in uh, in Italy, in Bologna, in Sicily. So I I work with photography as a, as a photographer, but also as a uh, as a teacher or organizing cultural activities, uh, workshop with uh, with kids and families, uh, with the local communities as well. Uh, during the uh, the last month. I've been working with my daughter, so I oh, gave wow. her a, a digital camera. Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> like the second lockdown, she, she was just uh, two years old during the pictures. And it was actually amazing how she was able to interpret the, the house, the home, with a totally new point of view. And, uh, and the idea of working with kids uh, somehow is, uh, is always interesting and uh, teaching me something about uh, photography itself. And, uh, um, and beyond that, I'm actually working on some research about a new project who, who I should start in the next, uh, in the next month uh, here in, in Sicily as well. Yeah, really looking forward to, to your new work, especially uh, that work with your daughter. Uh, where can people find you if they want to follow your work, you and your work? Uh, they can find you on the, on the website or most of my uh, Instagram account. I yep. think it's in the... Uh, the most uh, uh, up-to-date uh, um, uh, channel. Yeah, I have one more question for you because I noticed your Instagram only has nine photos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was kind of an exercise somehow. Yeah. It was a kind of liberation because there were thousands and thousands of pictures since 2012, I think. Yeah. I, I, I was pushing too much Instagram before to start uh, my the uni in photography. So at some point I said, okay, let's archive everything. And it was a, a really good exercise of editing. Yeah. Because it was a kind of uh, going to the therapist. So <laughs> let's, let's pick the nine pictures who are most representative. It's like a, a card, a business card. Yeah. So if you go to my Instagram page, rather than go scrolling for thousand thousand pictures, just see in one screen nine symbolic pictures and let's say some of them three or four are always the the same so for instance i don't know the last exhibition or the the picture of the book or the picture of my daughter or and then some some of them they change sometimes 
So it was a kind of exercise, but also maybe something about self-promotion. Yeah, I, I, I really love it. I think it's very effective. Um, so thanks for that. Um, uh, Camilla, for you, what are you working on? Uh, this is not the most in enthusiastic moment for a photographer. <laughs> so, that's, also, uh, that's also fine, of course. <laughs> no, but I mean, I'm not joking. Like, I, I, planned, I was planning to, to work on a project uh, spring of last year in USA about the legacy of Christopher Colomb. Oh, so right. Willing to interrogate the role of memory among the native community, especially in uh, and the Italo-American community. So what's the role of this, this historical figure for these two, uh, uh, the community, these two communities, especially probably in uh, Columbus, which is the capital of Ohio, so you know. Who, where is Columbus in Columbus in Ohio was the right pick? But of course I can't go in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in the US. Yes. So I'm doing some research uh, now. I'm kind of doing something here in Genoa. So the, 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 one of the, the city that they, they, they declared that gave the birth to, to Columbus. And on the other hand, I tried to experiment one thing that I never did. So I said, look, I can't travel. I want to do something completely far from my approach. Mm -hmm. So I started to work on this project about the uh, river Tiber that flows through Rome. And uh, so it's a complete, like, you know, a landscape. A, it's not a landscape. It's like a study of the landscape into this area. And it's a very, um, very slow photography process. So like I'm, I'm shooting with, you know, the tripod. Uh, taking time, so I'm, I'm really experiencing some okay. very, very new uh, practice, which is interesting, uh, and uh, let's see what is yeah. coming that. Cool. Um, yeah. same, same question for you. Um, where can people find you in the meantime, while we're waiting for your new work? Um, website, myname.com, and, and uh, then Instagram. Instagram also. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, we're out of time, so I would really like to thank uh, both of you uh, from Italy, and I also would like to thank you, Isabel, and I'd like to thank you very much. Um, on uh, March the 16th, we're back with the third edition of this series. Um, this time we will be talking about feminism and post-colonial um, critic with artists um, Aji Die and uh, Kamonlak uh, Sukchai. I still have to practice on the names. Um, every day, uh, Pakhaus has live casts around all different kinds of topics, so please check out the website. And for now, have a really good evening and thank you for uh, watching tonight. Bye. <laughs>